Cast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Bobby Rains here for our once every three weeks Investors Observer Members Only Workshop. Uh, welcome and let's get started. All right. So our agenda today will have what's going on at Investors Observer, market updates, and then the rest is member driven content, questions, site demonstrations, etc. We got a bunch of questions ahead of time, which I always appreciate. Um, so thank you to those of you who sent those in. Um, and yeah, if you have questions at any point during the presentation, just type them in the box and I'll get to them either in the moment or, uh, you know, we'll save some to the end. Uh, and yeah, if you submit questions ahead of time, I'll, you know, put them on a slide and you'll get a slightly, uh, hopefully at least slightly more coherent response from me as opposed to it being completely off the top of my head. All right. Uh, what's going on, Investors Observer? We don't have a lot of exciting things to announce at the moment, but we are working on uh, some fun stuff um, that we hope everybody will like. I don't have timetables for any of that, but, um, you know, as always, a lot of our product development comes from feedback we get from users. So if there's something you'd like to see or something you're curious about, um, you can always send us a note about it. And that may be a thing that we add in the future. All right, so market update. Uh, this is our standard S&P 500 one year of daily candles chart. Um, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, we kind of, you know, fell off a little bit last week or last week and the week before and then bounced off of the 50 day moving average. Um, that's not super exciting. Uh, in particular, it's kind of the sort of thing you expected. There were some particulars of that that we'll talk about uh, a little bit later that were more interesting, but in and of itself, that's kind of where we are. All right, so in terms of, yeah, so this is the same time period with the S&P 500 in white versus the equal weight version of the S&P in blue. Um, and so what this is showing is as opposed to the, the cap weighting of the standard S&P 500, um, where the big companies count for more, I think like the big five, like Apple, Netflix, Facebook, All right. Thank you, Claudia, for pointing out that my slides weren't changing. Um, all right. So, all right. Here's one year daily candles. Okay. This is the first slide I was talking about. Um, this one actually is three years, and I really included this to kind of point out how steep this rally has been um, up to and past the point. I mean, we got to previous all time highs and accelerated. Um, so some amount of pullback there was sort of to be expected. Um, you know, like this, the, the sort of steeper, the, the line is to some degree, the less sustainable it is. Um, which is not to say I expect more of a correction, just that I think that the next thousand points on the S and P 500 are going to take more than six months. Um, you know, like you don't, you don't see that uh, particularly often. Um, so that's what that is. All right, so here we are with the S&P 500 and the uh, equal weight. Um, and really, I just show this so you can see, right, the bigger this spread is between the equal weight and the um, cap weighted, just shows you how much outperformance is coming from the, the biggest companies, right? Your Apple, Microsoft, Google, uh, Facebook, um, those guys are something like a quarter of the S&P 500 now, I think. Um, and so, yeah, that's where you get that outperformance. But it's also why, right, when we have this happen a couple weeks ago, the impact on the equal weight was much less because the selling was mostly in those big tech names that have run up a whole lot. And a lot of the other stuff didn't fall so far. Um, so it's kind of things 
coming back in line a little bit. All right, what else is going on? Uh, we still sort of live in a virus-driven economy, um, right? Cases are falling at the moment. So the economic data is slowly improving. Uh, there's still a lot of unknowns, including sort of what happens from here, right? Schools are starting. Got a lot of stuff going on around that. Um, case counts seem to be going up in a lot of college towns, which is, I don't know, maybe not surprising. Um, it's not super comforting for those of us that live in college towns, but that kind of is what it is, I suppose. Um, and yeah, the director of the CDC told the Senate today that uh, he thinks Q3 or maybe late second quarter of 2021 is when a vaccine will be widely available. Um, so, you know, that's a year from now. Um, right, maybe, maybe the middle of next summer. Um, but yeah, certainly takes up all of this school year. Um, so it's kind of, uh, you know, it's a timeline. Um, it seems reasonable as opposed to some others I've heard that seem less reasonable, but um, it suggests that we're sort of going to be in this state of kind of suspended animation for a while. Um, we did get retail sales numbers today. Uh, the headline number, you know, overall retail sales were up 2.6% year over year up 0.6% month over month. That was a little bit of a miss in terms of um, expectations, but I, again, I feel like I say this every time, but I, yeah, well, I would hate to be trying to make economic models that predict the future in this economy. Um, so much stuff is just happening that nobody's ever seen before and is really hard to model and make predictions about. Um, so I don't, yeah, it's hard to know if that's a bad estimate or um, a disappointing data point is, is the, the point of that digression. Um, but yeah, one of the interesting things that we've noticed a lot is that the spending mix is different. Um, some of these things are starting to come back in line, right? So grocery stores, obviously when all the restaurants are closed, people are gonna keep eating. Um, so grocery store spending has been up, whereas restaurant spending has been way down. Um, grocery store spending actually fell month over month, whereas restaurant spending is up month over month. Um, that points toward things reopening, uh, some some amount of normalization there. One other thing that's hard to pull out of the retail sales data is because of various supply chain disruptions and things like that, there have been you know, some shortages of things and prices have gone up for certain things. So how much of grocery store spending is up because of prices and how much of it is changes in consumer behavior gets a little bit hard to tell. Um, department stores similarly way down year over year, non-store retailers, Amazon is most non-store retailers, but it's pretty much any online, you know, online only kind of business stuff like that is way up. Um, that's an interesting one because I have some questions about how much of that persists. Um, you know, there's probably, or at least it seems reasonable to think that some amount of online shopping that has gone online may not come back offline um, when this is over, um, but but it might, you know, we'll, we'll have to see. Consumer behavior tends to be hard to predict. Um, clothing sales are down 20% year over year, although August were up from July. Um, that's another sort of point toward reopening. Some of this may be right. I mean, there may be some back to school shopping, back to school season is certainly, let's say looks a lot different uh, this year um, because my kids, for example, aren't going to school, um, they're at home. Um, so we did make some sort of back to school purchases, but it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't a lot of new shoes and clothes. Um, you know, we got new, <laughs> new computer headsets and some things like that. I mean, the, you know, crayons and some of that stuff stays the same, but the some of the product mixes that people are buying for back to school certainly changes. Um, another interesting thing here is that building materials and garden supply spending has been up. Um, the housing market remains pretty hot. Um, and that's not super surprising. Um, 
right? People, people want to move and the people who are typically in the housing market are the people who are least affected by the pandemic um, in terms of, you know, economically anyway, in terms of working from home, things like that. Um, you know, some number of people who were software engineers or whatever who were working from home in a small apartment may have decided that if they're going to work from home for any length of time, they would rather not do it from a small apartment. Some people working in a city would decide they they want to do it in a different city or somewhere where they had more space. So all of those things are happening. You know, interest rates are obviously super low right now. Um, it's not a bad time to buy a house. Uh, house prices are going up. Um, that's typically a thing that happens when you have uh, low interest rates. Um, people buy houses a lot of times based on what they can afford in terms of a monthly payment as opposed to what the actual house price is. And so if the interest component of your monthly payment goes down, a lot of times the buying the house component will go up. Um, we've seen that, it, you know, before as interest rates move around. Um, and yeah, if there's some increase in demand for housing, housing supply is a thing that's a little hard to bring online um, immediately. So that tends to make the prices move a little bit too. All right, the other big thing, oh, let's do the, yeah, our, our sort of fast, uh, fast read economic data. Um, this is the Chase uh, Consumer Spending Tracker. We got a bump here again. Some of this, I think, maybe back to school shopping. Some of it is is definitely Labor Day, as we'll see when we look at the TSA data. Um, and it's going back down here. I mean, we saw we saw a retreat after July the fourth. That was coincident with some increase in coronavirus cases. We'll see if we have that again. Um, here, it's too early to tell if we're going to get coronavirus cases after whatever people did for Labor Day, but certainly it seems like there was a spike in spending around Labor Day that's uh, that's coming back down now. Um, and yeah, the TSA data also, if you look at the uh, the seven day average, Labor Day absolutely shows up here and then, you know, things are coming back down. We're at, yeah, down about 70% year over year in terms of, you know, the seven day average of people through the TSA. Um, and so here's the seven day average rate of change. Um, and you can see we had some, you know, things going back down. This is again, right? Like it went way up and then it's sinking again um, because of Labor Day holiday. It feels like, you know, if you tried to kind of take Labor Day out here, we we're pretty even through the summer. Um, it feels like we've sort of found a level for now. Um, We'll see if things start to reopen or don't and how uh, and how that goes. But yeah, we're kind of just on either side of zero now with things like, you know, a holiday making a big difference, which isn't super surprising. Um, but I don't think there's a lot of a lot of reason right now for people to get on planes. I don't think companies are changing their travel policies. And um, typically this would be sort of a lull in the travel season, I would expect. All right, so the Federal Reserve ended their two-day meeting today. They didn't really change anything. Um, the key passage from the statement was, you know, seeks to achieve maximum employment inflation at the rate of 2% over the longer run. Um, with inflation running persistently below the longer run goal, the committee will aim to achieve inflation moderately above 2% for some time so that inflation averages 2% over time and longer term inflation expectations remain well anchored at 2%. Um, this is part of the Fed's new strategy of treating 2% like a target that's somewhat symmetrical as opposed to sort of a ceiling. Um, We'll see how well they're able to stick to that. Uh, you know, there's some other stuff that makes me think, you know, I mean, we'll see. There's some other stuff that makes me think they're not as married to it as they could be, but we'll see. Um, the statement did seem to be more optimistic than in June. Uh, they also had, you know, all their projections. Um, the thing is, though, that Fed optimism can carry risk for the market. Um, right, tightening up monetary policy can uh, certainly have negative effects on stocks. Um, and then, yeah, can the Fed stick to the new regime? And then the other question I have sort of is what, how are we defining longer run? Is it 
2004 or 2024 is the average of 2024 to 2030. I don't, I don't really know how they define that. Um, but yeah, if we look at what we ex what the Fed expects, you know, changes in GDP, they're considering this year to be much less bad than they had um, next year. Uh, that has some weird knock-on effects in the out years in terms of looking less optimistic about those years. But I think. Yeah, I think if you went with this projection versus this projection, you probably prefer to only be down 3.7% this year and then four and three as opposed to down six and a half and then five and three and a half. Um, that's probably a stronger economy in the, the current projection. Um, unemployment rate, these are typically at the end of the year. So this is significantly better, although 7.6 is still pretty high and to be honest, we were at like three and a half before this started. So 4.6 at the end of 2022 is still a lot of people uh, being unemployed. Um, inflation, they expect to run a little bit hotter. Uh, yeah, then, yes. And so the Fed funds rate is basically where it is now out to their longer run projection where it goes back to two and a half. But I don't, how it gets from, how it gets from here to there is, is a, question they didn't really explain today and I haven't um, again the definition of longer run is a little bit nebulous um, so this is the famous dot plot that you may have heard people talk about um, so each dot is the opinion of one Federal Reserve governor or open market committee member um, about where interest rates will be at some point in time so one person sees them raising rate in 2022, there's four that expect some increase in 2023. And over the longer run, yeah, everybody's at two and a half. Um, again, how you get how you get from here to here, I'm not sure. And then how committed are these guys? We don't know who these guys are compared to these guys, but how committed are these people to the sort of lower for longer? We're going to let inflation run hot, um, you know, sort of scenario. And so then these are some other projections from the, the Fed governors. They're obviously expecting unemployment to come down pretty fast. Um, and again, the questions I have around can they stick to this 2% is a symmetrical target thing is expecting unemployment to bottom around 4% didn't work the last time. Um, and then as we'll see in a subsequent slide, coincident with their expectation of unemployment leveling off around 4%, um, there's some implied uh, inflation coming in there that didn't materialize uh, in the last recovery either. So they're expecting a pretty quick drop in unemployment and also uh, some inflation to come in, which just hasn't been the case in the recent past. Yeah, so here's inflation. Um, PCE actual from 2015 through the last four years. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure why anybody who lives through the post 2008 recovery would expect inflation to come up to 2% with unemployment still at four or four and a half percent. Um, but we'll see. All right, so that's sort of what's going on in the economy and the market. Um, you know, things kind of went a little sideways today. Uh, you know, they went way up when the, the Fed came out and then went back down to close around. Oh, let's see here. Yeah, it looks like tech stocks led the way down. Uh, NASDAQ lost 1.7 as of now. and. S&P 500 was down about a half a percent. Um, so yeah, that's sort of more of the same. I think there's still, you know, if you, we go back to, you don't normally expect these things to be lined up with each other perfectly, but there's a lot of room here compared to sort of the historical divergence. So potentially there's, you know, some more rebalancing to go there. Um, all right, so let's get into the questions. Um, Jeff asked, 
when to exit an options trade. As a rule, I hold contracts until they expire worthless, but lately I've taken a couple hits when stocks drop suddenly and there's no time to recover. Um, he was in a webinar, or, uh, sorry, a webinar the other day and the instructor was encouraging traders to put exit orders immediately after they take on a new position with a 50% target profit target for spreads and 70, 20, or, sorry, 25% for iron condors. Um, Doing that takes the guesswork out of closing a trade. You know, you can shorten the time frame in your trades, obviously, and money is freed up sooner. Um, so yeah, I mean, first of all, drops are drops at expiration are annoying. Um, but I, yeah, there's particular trades from you know seven or ten years ago that I remember. You know, um, I. Yeah, I had a trade on Tyson that was going to expire and somewhere around 11.30 on Friday, a goose in somewhere in the Midwest developed a cough and there was a, a four-hour bird flu panic that happened to kill my Tyson trade. Um, yeah, th those things happen and like, you know, I mean, anybody who's done any kind of, you know, sports betting or anything else, bad beats are bad beats. Um but you can, you know, certainly sort of try to minimize them. Um, they do happen, especially in volatile markets and different strategies are more or less exposed to this problem. Um, any of your sort of vertical strategies where everything's expiring all at once um, is, you know, particularly exposed to that. Your covered calls and diagonal spreads, um, you have, you know, a, another leg there that has a longer time horizon. And so you can keep the trade open and, you know, usually recover from those things a little bit quicker. Um, but yeah, an early, but early profit taking is totally acceptable. Um, you need to kind of structure your trade appropriately for that. You don't want to be, you know, some of the things you'll find, you know, super far out of the money sometimes can be hard to close early. Um, those a lot of times you don't have to worry about quite as much. Um, but you're also, you know, if you're super far out of the money, you're talking about a much lower target profit there. And so 50% may not be the wrong number or may not be the right number, excuse me. Um, but yeah, like if you're doing, you know, sort of relatively close to the money vertical spreads, 50% seems fine. 25% seems fine for iron condors. Um, we've done the same thing with diagonal spreads somewhere, you know, somewhere north of 75% usually for those because the percentage returns are lower. Um, but yeah, absolutely. There's no, you know, taking, taking a slightly smaller profit early, uh, can actually give you a higher, um, annualized return. Um, and certainly if it takes that sort of, you know, weird drop at expiration risk off the table or minimizes it, um, you know, anything that, anything that reduces risk while, uh, helping you, you know, preserve preserve capital or preserve gains and not have gains turn into losses seems like a uh, a plus all right so another question about closing trades um this is going to be a theme this week i think um this person says they don't know when to sell they have a tendency of wanting to hang on to a position because they think they'll they sell it they'll lose the opportunity to buy it back at the lower price of the initial purchase um Yeah, so again, this really sort of depends on your strategy and, and vehicle. Um, you know, if you're trading option spreads or something like that, the stuff we just talked about in terms of setting a, you know, setting a target profit and just putting in an order ahead of time is great. Um, that can really sort of take the guesswork and, uh, and bother out of it, um, especially because your profit is sort of capped there anyway in most of those trades. Um, with things like, you know, just buying stocks or buying options, it can be a lot harder. Um, you know, some experienced swing traders are trying to capture like 30% of a move in a stock, right? So that's a third because, right, market timing is hard. No one is buying at the bottom and selling at the top. Um, anyone who tells you they're consistently buying at the bottom or selling at the top is either selling something or setting themselves up for a, a real reckoning. Um, it just doesn't happen consistently over any length of time. Um, market timing is hard, right? I saw, yeah, I saw a chart this week from somebody at Bloomberg who had, yeah, it turns out that 
when Tesla and the other tech stocks rolled over, um, lumber futures, which they've also been in a rally, uh, rolled over at the same time. Like sometimes a bunch of things just sell off for a day or two for no apparent reason. Um, and nobody can predict it. And yeah, it's just what happens. Um, you're not going to sell at the top, just like you're not going to buy at the bottom. Um, so the, the real answer here is sort of don't try, be happy with what you can get. Um, so options let you be more aggressive in terms of typically you have less capital at risk. So you can let winners run a little bit further if you want before you try to take some of that risk off the table. Um, but still, market timing is hard. Um, it's hard or impossible and you can't do it. So, you know, you can cut back on positions, right? Um, I've seen people with options do things like if they get to 100% profit, you know, or sell it, sell some at 25%, sell some at 50%, sell some at 100%. Um, you know, I mean, if you, yeah. Uh, you know, things like that can, can really make a difference, um, but also really depends for what you're trying to do. Like the this bit here about if I sell it, I'll lose the opportunity to buy it back at the price that I bought in at. Um, I mean, this this seems like a stock that you're interested in holding for a long time. At which point, I would worry less about trying to catch regular daily fluctuations, right? If it's a stock you want to have in your portfolio for ten years, then when you want to sell it is in ten years. Um, right. If it's something that you bought because you thought it was going to go up, then you should reevaluate the stock every time you look to get back in. Right. Um, I mean, one of the things we talk about with managing option trades is consider would I buy the stock today? Well, I mean, yeah, if the stocks run up a lot and it pulls back a little bit, like, are you going to get back in because you think it's going to go up? Is there another stock you'd rather have that might go up more? Um, so I'm a little confused about about what some of the, the intentions are here. But generally, there's a general rule. Market timing is hard. Like, how do I sell at the top is not a question I can answer because no one in the history of the stock market has really answered it successfully for any, um, you know, any length of time. All right, so how to spot or find unusual options activity. Um, is there a screener recommended? Um, so yeah, there are various tools available that let you do all kinds of different things with options. Um, Thinkorswim from TD Ameritrade has a pretty good screener. Anybody who has a TD account can download the Thinkorswim desktop app. Um, they do have a mobile app. It doesn't have all the capabilities of the desktop app, but they do, they do have one. Um, and yeah, I mean, you could do simple things like look for cases where volume is higher than open interest, um, right? That typically means new positions being opened. And then, yeah, I mean, the Thinkorswim can get pretty complex. Um, you know, some of the stuff we do around here involves, you know, doing some simple screens and then checking some other things by hand, like looking to see if a lot of the trades are at the bid or at the ask, which will tell you whether or not it's buying or selling. Um, Things I, I know there are some other tools available, but I'm less able to speak to them just because I have less experience. Um, and then, yeah, I'm not sure about the second part of that first question. Um, and yeah, again, selling too, selling too early and leaving gains on the table is not something to be worried about. Um, right, I mean, we, we have this sort of discussion a lot in terms of, oh, you know, I did this trade and I made X, but if I hadn't done this trade, I could have made Y. Well, I mean, you at some point you have to consider like, okay, every time I made a decision in my portfolio, was that the decision, right? Like, did I buy the stock that went up the most that day? Probably not, right? So trying to maximize your entries and exits seems as silly as trying to buy the stock that went up the most every single day. Um, it's not something you're going to do. And as long as you're regularly making gains, um, I think I wouldn't worry about it. Um, and then, you know, what percentage of gains is normal to make for options traders really depends on the strategy. Um, even with you know, just like buying calls, you know, if you're buying in the money calls versus out of the money calls, 
and you know you you know you're trading weekly calls on Wednesdays are you buying you know three month calls and trying to hold them for a month all of those things all of those are strategies that absolutely can work but have very different uh you know sort of targets in terms of percentages and things like that all right so what is the exponential moving average and uh, so a moving average is just sort of the price of the last in number of right like the usually it's the closing price of a stock or index for the last in number of days um so it's like 50 or 9 or you know depending on what you're looking at um an exponential moving average is that except they put a heavier weight on the more recent prices um and then yeah people will say that stocks rebound at the 10 day or the 50 day whatever that is um you know those are absolutely things that happen right we talked earlier here about the s p 500 bouncing off the 50-day moving average if you go and look at a lot of tech stocks over the last two weeks a lot of them bounced off the 50-day moving average um moving averages absolutely are a place that provide support um and they can provide resistance on the way up also um but like all technical indicators they sort of work ex except for when they don't um there aren't really any like, oh, well, you know, this this is a strategy that always works. Um, the thing I always say is if it was a strategy that always worked, then everybody would do it. And if everybody's trying to buy, then no one's selling and the market doesn't work. Um, so there there isn't any sort of universal. This is what this is how it works, um, because that's that's not how that's not how markets function. I um, mean, then for indexes, what is it good to see daily? Um, I mean, green numbers are good as far as I'm concerned. Um, the rest is just sort of noise. Um, you'll get some red numbers in there. It doesn't mean it's time to panic, but typically going up is good. Going down is not good. Um, and yeah, the indices are all composed a little bit differently. So there's some broad correlation there. But, you know, like today we said the NASDAQ was down something like one and three quarters percent and the S&P 500 was down half a percent. Um, something like the NASDAQ, especially that's heavily concentrated in a particular sector, um, will tend to be less correlated to some other things. Um, Apple stock split was actually pretty good for the Dow in that regard in terms of it lowered the weight of Apple in the Dow. Um, now, like United Healthcare or something has the heaviest weight in the Dow, which will probably be less vol make the Dow less volatile overall. Um, it means it's going to go up less than the NASDAQ most days, but probably means it'll go down less than the NASDAQ on days when the NASDAQ is down. Um, all right, bond funds versus holding individual bonds, uh, worth the risk of holding a fund versus a bond if rates go up. All right, so bond funds just like as a concept aren't all the same um some track an index which is like you know five year bonds issued in some six month period uh you know and at a various credit rating you know like some are investment grade some are even a narrower slice of the investment grade universe some are obviously in the high yield space um some have target durations so some are like oh you know we're looking at 10 year you know trying to keep a roughly 10 year maturity in our portfolio um and there are various flavors of unconstrained right so some are unconstrained on what the holdings are some are or you know what the underlyings are in terms of like credit rating and things like that some are unconstrained in terms of duration some are unconstrained in terms of like are they buying like treasuries or corporates or some kind of asset backed security um PTIAX appears to be from my cursory research a little bit earlier today pretty much totally unconstrained um right though it seems like they'll buy basically anything that they think is undervalued um which essentially means you're betting on the manager um if you think the guy managing the fund uh is going to be good at finding undervalued assets then maybe that's a good one i don't know um there are some other you know interesting uh things in the fixed income space right there are held to maturity etfs now which 
avoid some of the typical sort of bond fund problems, right? Some of those problems are, right, in a rising rate environment, if you're trying to hold a portfolio of bonds that mature in 10 years, it means you're constantly selling some that are, you know, you're selling something that has a nine year maturity and buying something that has an 11 year maturity. So you can keep that 10 year average, right? Um, and so as the yield curve changes, sometimes you're losing money on that roll and sometimes you're gaining money on it. Um, <clears throat> if there was a, yeah, if you hold bonds and, you know, individual bonds to maturity, you get the coupon guaranteed. And then, you know, unless there's some default, get paid out at par. Um, at maturity. Bond funds that try to keep a target duration or do some trading are susceptible to some problems in a rising rate environment. Um, held to maturity ETFs are relatively new, but they avoid some of those typical bond fund problems. They also, they're pretty liquid. You can get it in and out relatively easily um, and you don't have to buy, you know, unlike buying individual bonds, you don't have to buy a thousand bucks at a pop or 10,000 at a pop, depending on the, uh, the bond there. Um, and yeah, rates are exceptionally low. A growing economy normally means rising interest rates, uh, which means falling bond prices. So, you know, you may get, you know, if, you, if you're willing to buy a bond and hold it to maturity, you get the interest rate that you bought it at until it matures. Um, and then again, unless your default paid out at par, if you're trying to trade bonds in a rising rate environment, that can be tough. Um, you know, we're in a, I don't know, 40 year run where shorting treasuries has been a bad trade. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, they haven't really traded with a negative rate yet. Um, I, I, I guess it's not impossible, but it will be, be interesting to see. Um, I don't really have a good crystal ball for what to say about rates over the next year. My guess is they're gonna be relatively flat to maybe down a little bit. I feel like we're really, well, one, really pushed against the zero lower bound right now. And two, you know, if the economy starts to rise, um, you know, starts to do better, you would expect some inflation and some things like that. People are gonna go find returns somewhere else um, as opposed to super low rate bonds. And then, you know, where to park a million dollars is a question I really can't even begin to answer. Um, it depends on what you need it for, when you need it, and several other variables. I mean, it's the question I have a million dollars and I want to retire in two years. Um, is it I have a million dollars and I want to put it somewhere for a year or two and then reassess and put it somewhere else and I don't plan to retire for 30 years? Um, yeah, there's, there's too many things going on there for me to really, uh, you know, speculate about what a good use for that is. All right, what is the ideal number of stocks to hold in an individual portfolio? Anywhere from five to 10 to a maximum of 20. I mean, it depends on how much time you wanna to devote to managing a portfolio. Um, it also, to some degree, depends on how you're gonna define stock. Um, I mean, if you wanna buy the S&P 500 ETF or something like that, um, you know, you only really need one thing there and you have exposure to 500 stocks. Um, I think a lot of people would probably tell you as the stock component of some sort of, you know, balanced across asset classes portfolio, that might be fine. Um, maybe you wanna buy some small cap fund or whatever else that's, yeah, that's totally fine. Um, but, you know, yeah, I, at a certain point, like if you're trying to manage a portfolio with 100 or 500 individual stocks, um, that's a full-time job. Um, it might be a couple of full-time jobs, in fact, to really do it well. Um, and so it really depends on like, you know, you trying to have some stocks in a portfolio, but you're not actively doing a lot of trading. I feel like the more active you're trying to trade, probably the smaller number you want. Um, if you're making buy and sell decisions on a daily basis, uh, you know, you don't, you don't want to be trying to day trade 20 positions. Um, you, you just can't do that. Um, something's going to fall through the cracks there. Um, so it really sort of depends on your, I mean, you may have 
20 or 30 sort of core holdings that you don't look at that often. You read the earnings reports and check to see if they've been upgraded or downgraded recently, then that's it. And then you may have a couple of things going at a time that are shorter term plays. Um, it really kind of depends on how you're trying to manage things. Um, yeah, and so the rule of 40, um, does it apply only to software or tech stocks or can it be applied to any company's income statement? So the rule of 40 is that revenue growth plus profit margin should equal at least 40%. Um, I mean, you could try to apply that to other companies. I think you're probably going to end up with a handful of software and tech stocks, though. Um, it's only really going to work for high growth, high margin businesses. Uh, companies selling physical goods are going to have trouble hitting that for more than a quarter or two. I mean, you're talking about, I mean, imagine trying to run a store where your profit margin plus growth rate equals 40%. You're either going to have to open a bunch of new stores while also running, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is the way you get the Starbucks problem where you have Starbucks is across the street from each other is trying to trying to chase things like that. Um, and at a certain point, yeah, other people come in and they're willing to take a slightly smaller margin, something like that. Um, it's not really sustainable as a way, you know, as business metrics outside of things like software and tech where, you know, I mean, think about Starbucks, for example, you know, Starbucks, there has fixed costs with every unit they sell, right? Whereas, Microsoft costs for every version of Windows or version of, you know, Word or whatever, there's no resource costs, there's the fixed costs are in developing it, but then every incremental unit you sell, it's pretty much all profit at that point, replicating ones and zeros is not expensive, um, whereas making any sort of physical good or transporting physical goods or any anything that other non-software businesses have to deal with uh, gets real tough. Um, so yeah, and then what should I do if my portfolio is significantly overweight in one sector and one stock, but that stock has been my best performer and the one I feel most confident in the long term? All right, so ignoring that when I feel most confident in the long term piece for a second, um, pr from a practical standpoint, rebalancing a portfolio is almost always going to be selling the winners and buying the underperformers, right? You're trying to keep some allocation between things, right? Some percentage of this and some percentage of that. And the way to get those percentages back in place is by selling the one that got too big and buying the one that got too small. Um, that means basically selling the things that went up and buying the things that didn't. Um, you know, markets and economies are cyclical. Things outperform for a while and then they underperform and different things outperform. Um, this is the whole idea of, you know, modern portfolio theory. Um, and any kind of asset diversification is you do this. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, if it's been your best performer, you probably can sell it and then you have it, you know, you own it at an extremely low cost basis at that point um, and you can keep holding it. Um, in terms of the one I feel most confident in the long term, there's a lot of psychology that I won't try to go into there um, in terms of, People tend to like things that have worked for them and they don't like things that haven't worked for them. Um, and so, yeah, you may feel confident about something that's been your best stock for a long time because it's been your best stock for a long time. Um, so without without really knowing why it's, you feel the most confident in it for the long term, I can't really address that part. Um, you may have a business case for it. You may, um, you know, it may just be you like it because it's the one that's done the best. Um, it's hard, hard for me to... Uh, to guess there. All right, that's the end of the pre-submitted questions. Thank you to everybody who sent those in. Um, let's get to some of these other questions that got sent in. All right, so Joe says, could you touch on extended hours trading? I don't use it, but obviously it can have a big impact on prices. Is it something I should worry about? How important is it to monitor as a casual trader? Um, this is a good question, Joe. We actually, um, you know, me and some of the other analysts had a conversation earlier this week about, you know, every once in a while you see an academic paper that says like, oh, all of the 
gains in the S&P 500 this year were made in after hours trading. Like look at the gains posted after hours and right. Like I probably a lot of us have seen those papers. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. It turns out if you're a buy and hold investor, you make money from the after hours and you make money from the, uh, you know, the day hours. Um, it doesn't really matter. Um, I think this is a, a reason to have some diversification across strategies um, in terms of some short term investments and some long term investments. Um, you know, obviously, I think what most people are worried about is things to go way down in after hours trading. Um, and that, you know, after earnings reports or things like that, that can be a problem. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, it stands to reason that if there was no after hours trading, you'd still see gaps at the open, right? Trading stops, the company reports earnings or some other news comes out and then trading reopens. If nobody wants to buy at the price they were buying at yesterday, the stock is just going to open lower with or without after hours trading. Um, I don't really think it matters that much. I don't think it has much long-term effect on the price. I think what actually happens is a lot of news comes out when the stock market isn't open. And so then when the stock market reopens, people's sentiment has shifted and the bids and asks have moved around and it, things reprice. Um, a lot of times what you'll see, in fact, if you look at a chart that has the after hours trading in it is, a lot of times the after hours move in either direction is way overstated. Um, now, sometimes that's because somebody read the earnings release and then listened to the conference call and, you know, things got reeled in a little bit. Um, but a lot of times it's just because those after hours trading sessions are thin and, uh, you know, thin, thin markets tend to be a little bit more volatile than, uh, than the more liquid ones. So I don't... I don't really think it's a thing to worry about. I think the news that's moving the stock is is much more important than uh, than what's actually happening after hours. Um, all right. So Thomas says he doesn't see single option recommendations on our website. Um, we don't currently have single option recommendations. It's one of the things that we have talked about adding in the future. Um, don't have a time frame for it. Uh, but it is on the list. It may show up at some point. All right. And Michael wants to know about Sorrento Therapeutics. So let's see what we can find about Sorrento. Sorrento has been an interesting stock. It went way up here on some... Oh, I don't follow it super closely. They were supposed to have a pretty good uh, coronavirus test, and then a short seller released some things that cast some skepticism on it, and they went back down. I haven't followed it as much since then. Um, but that's that's generally what this is about here. Um, so, yeah, I think it's probably... <clears throat> general rule, I think I probably feel better about it here than I did uh, at 1875. Um, you know, analysts are still expecting it to go up. The average recommendation is a strong buy. Um, you know, I mean, we know we know why the technical indicators are are low for it. Um, and so it's, at some point, it all comes down to how much do you believe in their coronavirus test, which I yeah, am not equipped to stand here and tell you about. Um, but yeah, I mean, the analysts seem to like it, which is, I mean, it's, it's their job to, to know. Um, so from that standpoint, I don't think it looks terrible. I think it was... It's entirely possible that it was overvalued there and it's undervalued here. I don't, I don't really know. Um, it really seems like it comes down to to that coronavirus test and some other things. Um, the company's not profitable, which means at some point they're, you know, for the stock to, to retain any value over any length of time, they're going to have to come up with a, an actual sellable product at some point. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the. Uh, 
the deal with the with Sorrento. All right, so Steve has a really interesting question here that I think is sort of tangentially related to, to Sorrento. Um, he says, how should I think about small microcap type companies such as biotech that have no approved products or revenues, but have a pipeline that shows promise? Uh, the market doesn't seem to value such companies. They have no sales or earnings yet. Should these generally be avoided until they get approved products? Um, so, yeah, I know everybody hates it when uh, you ask a question, somebody argues with the premise of the question, um, but this bit about the market doesn't seem to value such companies, um, I would kind of argue with. Um, I mean, you can look at Sorrento here as an example. Um, this is a stock that was less than $2 a couple years ago, and it's a, eight dollars now and it was almost twenty dollars earlier this year without ever having a approved product or any revenue um you know i mean we could go we could go look at some electric car companies if you wanted that also uh don't have an approved product or you know maybe their car only works if it runs downhill kind of a thing um that the market has bid way up um so, I mean, the way I would look at those is, I think you have the right attitude here, is they're very speculative, right? Um, if you feel like you have some ability to evaluate that pipeline that isn't just taking the company's management word for it, that their pipeline is very promising, um, then by all means, yeah, people have gotten, yeah, I mean, that's how you get exceptionally rich is, you know, buying something like this and having it become you know, some, you know, have some product that becomes universally accepted and used. That is a, uh, that's an incredible way to make an incredible amount of money. Um, but a lot of these fail, right? So what I would say is you should have sort of the, you know, venture capital mindset where, you know, VC funds will typically invest in hundreds of startups. Um, and they fully expect most of them to fail, um, which should tell you something about what your position size should be, right? Um, you don't want to be like, oh, well, I don't have a lot of money, so I should just pick three that I really like and put more in there. No, that's not the right answer. Because um, what are the chances you're going to pick the three that win? Um, so you want to have relatively small position sizes and spread things around. Um, and that is, uh, that's a better way to do that. Um, unless, again, unless you have some, you know, some, some information that lets you evaluate their pipeline in a way that, uh, yeah, that I frankly don't, don't know how to do. Um, you'd have to be able to read, read the medical journals and look at, look at those things. Um, is how you would evaluate the pipeline and, and get a good uh, a good sense on that. And even then, things fail, right? Um, you know, big companies have drugs that fail all the time. Uh, so yeah, all right. How do we determine that a stock is a good value but an underperformer that will do well after you rotate into it? Um, so that's a good question. Um, and really, it comes down to things like. You know, you don't just want to buy stocks that are down. Um, what you may want to do is look for things like, right, look at some sort of a sector and industry list, right? Like things tend to be cyclical across the market. So technology has been winning. So if you're rebalancing a portfolio and selling technology, well, what hasn't been winning? Financial services and energy. So you may want to go to energy and say, Right, what are some of the best stocks in the energy sector? Um, and you may not want to pick super small caps just because they can be more dangerous when the economy isn't super healthy. Um, energy is maybe a bad example here because there are some oh, some broader things at play in terms of the future of oil stocks altogether. 
Um, but financial services for sure is one um, that you can think about, right? Um, and so, yeah, look for things that are maybe undervalued that seem to have a strong franchise value or some other uh, some other thing like that that um, you know is on you know I mean looking at this list PayPal Morgan Stanley State Street Progressive these are things that don't seem like they're going to go away um, you know they're certainly financial services struggles when the economy is weak. Um, so, you know, I'm not recommending everybody sell their tech stocks and go buy financial services today. Um, but that's the, the, the process, if you would, is I wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily start looking for underperforming stocks. What I'd start doing is saying, okay, hey, what parts of the economy are probably undervalued right now? And then you go look for the winners there. Um, because that's probably a place where you, uh, you know, do better over the long term. You know, finding finding the best stock in a in a weak industry is probably better than finding a stock that just looks terrible and you think it's going to turn around, um, unless you have some real reason to think it's going to turn around. Um, so yeah, Barbara, high momentum stocks. You can use our stock screener and look for things like the. The short term technical score or the sentiment score. So, the sentiment score is going to be the shortest term. Um, that's going to give you an idea of the stock's performance um, over about the last five days. Um, whereas something like the short term technical score will find stocks that, um, you know, are rising over, you know, like more of a weeks to a couple of months kind of time frame. All right, what is your take on Kodak? It had a major jump today. Do I think it has a future? Um, I don't know it, yeah, I mean, I'm skeptical of Kodak. Uh, it was not that long ago that Kodak had a big announcement that they were going to, you know, do something where they were managing image rights on the blockchain, and that was going to be their new thing. And that is not a big enough part of their business. They even mentioned it in their last uh, 10Q, um, right? So their stock popped on that news and some insiders sold a bunch of stock and uh, yeah, but now I don't even know if that's part of their business anymore. Um, and the thing today, the thing today was basically Kodak reviewed their own practices around the news from that loan they got from the government and they found that they didn't do anything wrong, but they're going to make some changes to their policies and procedures um, going forward. I mean, if you believe the government will unfreeze the loan and you believe that Kodak can successfully pivot into drug manufacturing, it may be an absolute steal. Um, personally, I think there's probably things that are more likely than that. Um, but in terms of, you know, like sort of like we were talking about with that, you know, the drug companies and, and pipelines like that earlier, you know, if you want to make a small bet on something that's extremely speculative, Kodak is absolutely, um, you know, absolutely there. But I don't, I, I don't really have any reason to think it's a better buy than any number of other things. All right. So how can you tell if positive news has actually increased the value of a stock or if it's being pumped up by high volume to dump? Um, for example, GoGo. I don't know. Exactly the recent story on GoGo. -Go. Yikes. Okay. Um, looks like they got a equity infusion, a new contract. Yeah, I can't tell with this particular company. Um, 
from a quick scan of the headlines here. I'm typically skeptical when a company doubles in value from month to month and there isn't like, hey, we doubled our business, um, right? Like doubling your, having something that would cause you to double your future earnings would be a great reason for your stock price to double. Um, I'm not sure I see that in that quick scan of the headlines there from GoGo, um, which is not to say that I think, you know, 330 back in August was the correct price any more than I think $11 today is the correct price. Um, but generally, right, like look at what analysts and people who study the company are saying. Um, you know, not necessarily the loudest analysts, but kind of the most analysts. Um, the loudest analyst is, yeah, often just the loudest and not necessarily the most right. Um, but I think if there's a general consensus um, you know, about something that's probably a good thing to go with. But I, yeah, I'm, I'm always skeptical. Yeah, I wouldn't buy GoGo -Go here, just looking at the chart. Um, I may do some more research and take that back, but just generally, if a stock has doubled in a month, um, it's probably at best fairly valued, if not a little overvalued. Um, Again, like we talked about with the whole market earlier, right? The steeper the line, the less sustainable that sort of move is, um, right? I mean, the next, yeah, the next seven dollar move in GoGo -Go is going to take longer than a month would would be my prediction here. Um, and so, if you're looking for something that's going to go up, you know, or more than double, I guess it tripled um, in a month or two. GoGo -Go already did that; it's probably not going to do it again. Um, that's the kind of thing that I look at there. All right, so uh, it's a little past five here. I'm gonna try to wrap up here. Um, there's one more question here I'll get to is what's the best way to hedge against steep drawdowns? Um, there's a lot of ways to do this. Uh, you know, diversification is one of them, right? Um, you know, stuff like we saw last week, if you had the S&P 500, you lost a couple of percent. If you had a whole lot of Apple stock, you lost a lot of money. If you had a whole lot of Tesla stock, you lost even more money. Um, so diversification is a great way to hedge. Um, ETFs are a great way to diversify, right? Like we talked about earlier, you know, you can buy 500 stocks in the S&P 500. You can buy one ETF. Um, that's pretty handy. Uh, you know, you can also do things like, you know, there's put buying and things like that. Um, Put buying on ETFs is a good way to hedge the entire market. Um, you know, in the same way that buying 500 stocks is a giant pain in the neck and has a lot of transactional costs that can be avoided if you just buy the one ETF. Um, you know, if you're worried that your broad portfolio of stocks that roughly correlates to the S&P 500 might crash, you can buy some puts on, say, the SPY ETF. Um, it's they're pretty liquid, uh, which means they're relatively cheap in terms of the bid ask spread. And you only have to buy one option instead of a bunch, which is typically gonna be cheaper and have fewer transactional costs um, as far as that goes. So yeah, thank you all for coming. I will look through these questions and maybe send follow-ups to some of you later. I know I didn't get to everybody today, um, but thank you all for coming. We will send out a recording of this tomorrow. Um, but yeah, thank you all for coming and we will talk to you in three weeks. If you have any questions before then, uh, you can always use this help button or give us a call or send us an email and we are happy to help you. Thank you.